Hello, as we approach the end of our series on Genesis, the first three chapters, we're looking again at the Garden of Eden. Now, we observed in an earlier talk that this can be located in what is current day Iraq, but the emphasis in Genesis 1 to 3 is not of a geographical setting, but in the setting out of the foundations of our faith and our authentic relationship with God and with other people. But the garden motif is a very fascinating one to trace it all the way from Genesis chapter 1 through to Revelation 22. Many years ago I was invited to give a sermon in a cluster of churches in England and I'd been given a title the title was Closer to God in a Garden Than Anywhere Else on Earth. Curious title, but I was very happy to speak on that, and particularly on a biblical text which might have been suggested by the title. When the service was concluded and I stood at the door and people greeted as they went out, everybody seemed to be very appreciative and expressed their gratitude, except one person. One very disgruntled lady met me at the door and said she thought she was coming to a talk on gardening, not a biblical exposition. Well, the garden motif runs all the way through the Bible. So, in the Garden of Eden, it's the locus of God's creation of humanity. The Garden of Eden is the place where human sinful disobedience takes place, rejecting God's rule. Then in the Garden of Gethsemane, in the Gospels, is where Jesus resolved to do the Father's work and to face the crucifixion. The Garden of Paradise is mentioned by Jesus as he speaks to the penitent thief on the cross. The Garden Tomb is the place where the body of Jesus was laid and where subsequently Jesus rose again. And the Garden City is the new glorious heaven where God rules and welcomes his people in the book of Revelation. Well, the first two of those references, the Garden of Eden, we've already looked at and dealt with, uh, dealt with in uh, various ways through previous talks. So let's move on to the third of those gardens, the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, Gethsemane was a location just outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem is set on a high hill, and if you go down the valley to the valley floor across the Kidron Valley, just outside Jerusalem, you get to the foothills of the Mount of Olives. And at that foothill, there is a garden of olive trees, and that's the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a place where Jesus loved to go when he was in Jerusalem, both for relaxation and for prayer and time aside. After the Last Supper with his disciples, Jesus did trace the route down to the Kidron Valley, across the Book of Kidron, the Brook of Kidron, and to the Olive Grove. And there, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed earnestly. He prayed that he might not have to endure the suffering that was due to come to him in a few hours' time. If it's possible, let this cup of suffering pass from me, he pleaded, on three separate occasions. But in the end, he resolved on his knees to do the Father's will, and having made that resolution in prayer on his knees, he was then able to stand up and face his captors and endure all that was going to come his way in the next 15 to 18 hours. It was the Garden of Gethsemane where the final scenes of that great saving event began to be rolled out. But it was the Garden of Eden where it was first mooted, it was first enunciated. When Jesus hung on a cross on that Roman gibbet, there were two criminals crucified either side of him. One taunted him terribly and said, save yourself and us if you are the Son of God. But the other one pleaded with him, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus turned aside to this man and said this, through gasps of breath. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now, that's a fascinating word because its origins are Persian paradise. And the etymology of that word implies that a, a Persian king might give to a favoured subject 
the freedom and ability to walk with the king in his garden, in his walled garden by the palace. It was a great privilege. And Jesus uses this evocative term to say to this man, today you will walk with me, King Jesus, in the paradise of heaven. So that's another garden. When I was a student many years ago, I worked for a tear fund project in Israel. And we were working in a hospital in Nazareth, but at the weekend we made our way down to Jerusalem. And whilst there, we went to a site which may or may not have been the site of the garden tomb, the place where in a rocky promontory a cave was carved out and a tomb was there where Jesus' body may have been laid, bound, the rock rolled over the front, the soldiers guarding it. And also where three days later he rose again. And as Mary uh, encountered him on that day with her head down, not looking him in the eye, thought he was the gardener. So we're talking about a garden. And that may or may not have been the site where Jesus' body was laid and where he subsequently rose. The death and the resurrection of, the G of Jesus are at the very heart of our Christian faith. Paul resolved to make sure that his preaching was always focused upon the cross. It was central to the Christian faith. And he said elsewhere in his writings, he said, look, the resurrection is also pivotal. If it never took place, then our faith is in vain. So the cross, Jesus' death and the resurrection are at the very heart of Jesus' faith. So a garden which housed his body at one stage in this rock tomb, once occupied, now vacated, because the risen Lord Jesus is no longer there. And finally, following this theme of gardens through, we get to the last book of the Bible, Revelation. And in Revelation 22, the last chapter, we don't find the word garden recorded, but what is described is effectively a garden city. We find there are crystal clear water courses running through this city. There are trees, leaves and fruit in abundance. There's a jewel bedecked city, radiant with light and only outshone by the glorious presence of God himself and by the Lamb who is there, the Word made flesh. Now the Lamb of God radiating his glorious presence, Jesus himself. So, Eden... To heaven. Genesis to Revelation. Here to eternity. God's story, our story. And all the foundations of this were established in the first three chapters of the Bible. But this garden motif gives us a suitable pattern upon which to hang our understanding of creation, salvation, redemption, and one day being gloriously present with God in heaven. Well, thank you for watching this, the 39th talk out of our 40 in Genesis, the first three chapters. But I do want you to do this. Would you please reflect on the garden motif as it runs through the Bible to its glorious climax? And ask yourself this, is your faith firmly fixed on the effective death and real resurrection of the Lord Jesus? Are you thrilled? at the prospect of being a redeemed member of God's brilliant garden city, heaven.